Welcome to Small Practice Support Information Session number 19. In this Law Society of Ireland recording, Michael O'Scoghill talks to Justin Purcell and provides tips for self-employed solicitors on making a tax return. I'm delighted uh, to be joined by uh, Michal Oskahol, Director of Taxation from Crow, uh, to talk to us at the Small Practice Information Session 19. So we're going to talk today about small practice tips uh, or tax return tips for 20, uh, 2020. So uh, uh, an exciting area because there's been a, bit, a few changes uh, in the budget yesterday. So uh, for those sort of tax train spotters out there, I hope that uh, we, we all enjoy some of the some of the twists that are, that are ahead for us today. So, so handing over to you, uh, Michael, you're very welcome and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say to us today. Thank you, Justin, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, as, as Justin said, we've, we've had some uh, changes in the budget yesterday, so it's, it's extremely topical. I suppose income tax is always uh, a, uh, a, you know, a challenging time of year for everybody. I mean, we find as practitioners that you know, you tend to get very involved with the with the clients more so on income tax than in any other tax that it almost becomes very personal. And so we, we kind of were aware of the types of challenges that it can create, particularly for professions such as such as the legal profession of solicitors, where you know you haven't had any taxes deducted throughout the year. You have um, the you know potentially a large liability, the challenge of preliminary tax, as well as trying to pay off your 2019 liability and so on. So well aware of all of that. So hopefully today we'll at least try and reduce maybe the anxiety around this, if not the tax bills, but who knows, we might even look, uh, discover some methods to reduce your, your, your overall tax bills as well. So the first thing maybe to look at there uh, in terms of our, our first slide there is- So I'll just share the slide there, Michael. So yeah. just maybe just to say to people, if you have any questions, if you could send them to, through to us in the chat, we're also just gonna ask a few uh, poll questions as we go along. Uh, and then we can uh, ask Michael any questions also at the end. So it's just, we're just trying to understand sentiment a little bit more. So I'm just launching one poll now and then I'll launch the slides. So if people could uh, give us a bit of an indicator on that, we'd really appreciate it. So, you know, I'm gonna share my computer now. Should be correct. Okay. Thank you, yeah, so. So can you see that? Uh, I can, yes, I can see that, so there we go, so thank you, uh, thank you Justin. Yeah, so essentially the, the first bit of big news, well, it's probably a few weeks old now, is that the, the tax deadline has been extended, so it, it was meant to be 12th of November, it's now pushed out to the 10th of December, that's if you file and pay your returns online, okay, so that's welcome in itself, but there's a second important date as well that's, that's come back into vogue again more recently, which is the, the old paper deadline of the 31st of October. And the reason this is relevant is that initially a couple of weeks ago, Revenue confirmed that they were, they were prepared to enter into sort of installment arrangements or phased payment arrangements for certain income tax liabilities, provided you applied by the 31st of October. And following yesterday's budget, um, it's, it's even more dramatic the news, if you like, because Revenue are now saying, or the government yesterday announced, that the tax warehousing facility that was introduced for VAT and PAYE now extends to cover income tax liabilities for self-assessed taxpayers as well. And you can warehouse effectively your, the entire tax payment that's due in, in the coming weeks, this being any balancing payment that you owe for 2019, as well as your preliminary tax for 2020. And you can warehouse it for a 12 month period, so up to the end of October 2021, at a zero interest rate. So that's obviously quite attractive. So you could actually push out, if you wished, your entire tax payment for another 12 months. And the, the, I suppose the, the, the upside to that is quite obvious from a cash flow point of view. The downside, if there was one, is, well, what I, what I would say is that you should just take a broader view over the next year or so. Obviously, if you don't pay any tax this year, your, your, your one-off big payment, it sort of stands to reason that this time next year, you could be looking at two such payments. So you'd be trying to play catch up, if you like. So you want to factor that into your, into your calculations. And you might give consideration to things like, for example, might it be an idea to, if you're going for this warehousing to maybe set up a bit of a direct debit in the new, say, over 2021, 
or make periodic payments to maybe to bring your bill down gradually, just in the point of view of managing your own cash flow. But as a rate of financing, it is attractive. It's a 0% rate for 12 months. And if for whatever reason this time next year, you felt that you were still unable to discharge it in its entirety, you can ask revenue at that point for a further, it wouldn't be an extension of the warehouse as such, you'd be asking them for a kind of an, an installment arrangement to pay it over a period of months maybe. And they've confirmed that they, in the budget yesterday that there would be a reduced rate of interest of 3% payable there as opposed to the normal 8% per annum that would be payable. So you could push it out even further to a certain extent, but again, naturally, there's always a day of reckoning here. The longer you put it on the long finger, I suppose the more these debts start to mount. So it, uh, I suppose in, in summary, what you would say is that these recent announcements, they certainly give breathing space uh, to, to practitioners and I suppose taxpayers more generally, but, uh, an but also you should take the opportunity as well just to consider maybe the bigger picture over the coming 12 months. Um, one of the points made on the slide there probably, probably passed itself a little, a little bit for this year at this stage. It's preliminary tax for 2020. So what you would normally have been paying uh, on the 10th of December, as is the date now, is you'd be paying your balancing payment for 2019 and you would be paying preliminary for 2020. And that would typically be actually the bigger payment. So your preliminary for 2020 would be based on either 100% of 2019 or 90% of 2020. And normally what you would say is that unless your income was going up, you would, you would base it on, on, uh, on a, sorry, unless your income was going down, you would typically base it on 100% of last year. It was, a guarantee, it was a fixed payment and you know, you, you, had you weren't paying too much. There is a third option there, which is to pay 105% of 2018. Sometimes that gives a lower payment. Unfortunately, you would have had to have set up your first direct debit by the end of September in order to avail of that. So we've probably passed the, the, the deadline for that. Although if you're, if you're a solicitor who's already got some sort of direct debit paid up, I know a lot of solicitors do, they just like to pay a little bit throughout the year. If you've already got a direct debit set up on an ongoing basis, you might want to revisit that and see, is that an option? But to a certain extent, the whole tax warehousing has, has maybe, uh, has kind of overtaken a lot of that stuff. General comment we make as well is that the liability that you would be paying on the 10th of December, uh, remember, we're obviously, as everybody knows, we're in the COVID era now. So we've all had sort of seven months of various restrictions and challenges and so on. Um, so we're paying, if you like, out of our COVID cash flow. But most of the tax that you would be paying on the 10th of December would relate in reality to the pre-COVID or the pre-pandemic era because it's your balancing payment for 2019, which is obviously pre-COVID, and even your preliminary tax for 2020 it will be based on whatever year end you have in 2020. And I know a lot of solicitors' practices will have year ends of maybe, you know, January in some cases, March is a popular year end, even June to a certain extent. Most of those profits on which you're paying your preliminary tax will actually have been earned before COVID arrived on our shores. So you have that, partic that particular challenge as well. So I suppose in light of all of that, the lesson here would be take the next couple of weeks in particular to just consider your options. This warehousing is, is, is a welcome development, but maybe look at it as well in, 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 in the bigger terms of the bigger picture and try maybe and project forward as much as you can over the next 12 months as well from a cash flow perspective. Okay, so that's probably... So, Mio, there's a question there is, uh, around, is interest payable on tax which is paid by installment over a number of months or year? Yeah, so what would happen is normally, uh, Justin, the answer is yes. Normally, if you enter into an installment arrangement for income tax, uh, the, there's a daily rate applied, applied and it, it works out at 8% per annum on an annualized basis. It's a little bit higher for VAT at 10%, but that would be the norm. Now, what revenue are saying in light of COVID-19 is there's a couple of things there. If you had any pre-COVID debt, so the likes of your VAT and your PAYE before, before 2020, essentially, any of that old debt, they're now encouraging people to come forward and enter into installment arrangements, and they give you a reduced rate of interest of 3% per annum on that. So that's a, that's a good start. For your income tax for 19 and 20, Effectively, the rules around that are that 
they were saying you can enter into an installment arrangement for that as well at 3% per annum, but that's somewhat been overtaken by the warehouse announcement yesterday, where you can put it into the warehouse for a period of 12 months and get a zero rate on it. And if after those 12 months you go on to an installment arrangement to try and clear it, the rate they say would be 3% as well. Now what we're saying about the intervening sort of 12 months, even though you have the luxury of the warehouse, there's nothing stopping you deciding to pay off some of that debt over the next 12 months as well, if you feel from a cash flow point of view that you want to you know, bring your debt levels down or whatever. Um, and you can do that simply, you know, by just making payments over the, over the next 12 months. And there wouldn't be any interest on those because what you would do now with your 19, 20 liabilities is bring the prices. You'd ask them to go into the warehouse. So you have the, the facility there to leave them there for 12 months, if you like, at a zero rate. But you can, if you wish, pay them down during that 12 month period, if you go from a cash flow point of view, if you feel that's, that's the best route to take. And so, just a quick question on that, Michael. If I put the money into the warehouse and I, I don't pay anything for the, uh, on it for the first year and then it's 3% thereafter, is there a time limit that I have to pay that money within? Or is that an agreement I come to with the revenue? Uh, yeah, so that's an agreement you come to. So, the warehouse is a, is a 12 month facility. At the end of that 12 month period, then the tax falls due. So the critical thing is that you will, this time next year, that you approach revenue a few, good, say at least a few weeks before the end of the end of October 2021, essentially, and that you tell them at that stage if you if, that you, if you have difficulties and if you want to enter into an installment arrangement. Now at that time, at that stage, installment arrangements are always by agreement of the revenue. So you would have to set out why it is that you need the installment and why you can't discharge it and so on. And then you enter into a, an agreed period. Now, revenue typically on installment arrangements, but again, this is subject to negotiation. They like to see a down payment and they say themselves they like to have it up at 40%. But, you know, as I said, it, who knows what stage the world will be at this time next year. But they like to look at a down payment. And then over a period of time, you know, six months, nine months in some cases, but that type of thing. Revenue say they won't go beyond two years. Now with income tax, because you're building up income tax, I suppose every year, it's probably not a great idea to put it on the never, never. You probably would look to get it cleared in a, in a, in a relatively short number of months. But it is subject to agreement with revenue. And as I said, who knows what the parameters will be this time next year. Okay, so we move on to the second slide then. Sure, yeah. I think uh, Katrina is uh, asking a question there, what about paying into pensions? So I think we're going to cover that right now. Absolutely, right of us, Katrina. We've got that coming on the next, on the, on a future, on, a, on, the, on this slide, actually, yes. Yep. So when you look at ways, so if we forget about the payment, and if you're looking at your actual liabilities here and see what, what can I do? So there are a couple of, there are a couple of schemes out there still. I mean, a lot of the, the famous tax schemes weren't, uh, weren't, uh, have been largely phased out over the year, over the last 10 years, as well, I suppose, the, the property schemes and even to a large degree film schemes, which were popular. Uh, the emphasis on a film scheme has changed so that it's now the film company that claims rather than the, rather than income taxpayers. But there are still a couple of schemes out there and probably the two most common that you see were pensions and EIS. So with pensions, quite simply, this is, as the slide says there, a tax efficient way of funding your retirement. You can put a percentage of your, of your relevant earnings as revenue call them, into a pension scheme and get tax relief for them. And the big, the big point here is that if you make the pension contribution by the tax deadline day of the 10th of December, so if you're filing online and you're putting through your pension payment, uh, if you do that, you can claim tax relief against your 2018 tax return. Now it's important that you talk to your pension broker or your pension company and that you ask them to make it clear in the certification that they issue that the contribution is being made with, with reference to deductibility against the prior year, against 2019, and they should be well able to do that because they need to say they're well familiar with all of this. So uh, the critical thing then is, is that you can put a percentage in. So it depends on your age and your income levels. Uh, so typically somebody in their 20s can put 15%, and it rises then each decade gradually, 20, 25, until your uh, age 50, in your in, in age 50 to 54 becomes 30%, uh, late 50s it becomes 35%, and when you're 60 or over it's 40% of, of, your, of your earnings essentially, uh, of your profits. 
but subject to a maximum profit of 115,000. So the very maximum pension contribution that anybody could make would be, so, and claim tax relief on it, is somebody who's over who's 60 or above in 2019 could put in 46,000, which is essentially 40% of 115. So if that person had profits of 115 or above, they could make the maximum contribution. But say somebody who had pro somebody who's aged 45 and has made a, a taxable profit of 100,000 euro, uh, they could put in 25% of that 100,000, which is 25,000 obviously, and claim the relief against 2019. And just on one practical point, a little bit subtle, the age limit is by reference, if you're claiming it for 2019, if you're backdating it, it's by reference to the age that you were in 2019. So somebody who was born in 1980, for example, was 39 last year. They're subject to the limit for the people in their 30s, which is 20%, even though they're now 40 at this stage. So it's a pr practical point there. Um, so that's, that's pensions. So, so Michael, can I just ask a quick question there that somebody's asking me? So the deadline for claiming the income tax warehouse scheme is, my understanding, 31st of the 10th, the yeah. 31st of this month. And then the second part of that question is, if I file my return by that date, the 31st of the 10th, can I pay my pension contribution and warehouse the tax liability for 12 months? Or would revenue be a little uncomfortable about that one? Yeah, I suppose we are. The one comment I'd make on this is that this was announced in the budget yesterday. So we are awaiting some guidance from revenue again um, and, and to need the relevant legislation. But generally with a pension contribution, you have to make an, what we call an election in your tax return and you have to have paid it. So on a strict reading, it would be 31 October, but maybe we await some revenue guidance on that point. So in a typical year, you would have to make the pension payment along with the tax payment at the same time. But there, yeah. well, we don't know this, but possibly there's, it, it, it could be changed, but, but who knows? But yeah, and typically in the old pre-COVID days, 31 October was the paper deadline and the 12th of November, or thereabouts, kind of two weeks later typically, was your online deadline. But the requirements to get the online extension was that you filed online, that you paid your tax using the Ross online facility, and then by extension you were allowed to, to do the pension as well. Te technically, if you didn't pay your tax by the 12th of November, revenue could say, well, you should have put everything in on the 31st of October. And they had that, that uh, authority if you like to do that. So again, on a strict reading here, uh, because the tax falls due, if you don't pay the tax, it, it defaults back to 31 October, everything. But again, we await like revenue guidance notes on, on, on this area as well. So there may be a little bit sure. okay. come in the next number of days. So it be prudent for the time being to take 31 October as your deadline if you're interested in warehousing. So then on EIS, this is the other scheme that you see. And I, I suppose a comment on EIS, but first of all, from a tax point of view, it's actually been, it's been simplified again over the last uh, 12 months or so, like last year's budget, the relief is now all given in the year that, that you make the investment. So what happens is you make an investment in a, in a qualifying company. So a company, say for example, EIS is, is geared really to help companies raise funds tax efficiently. So people who, income taxpayers who invest into these particular companies, buy shares in these companies and they have, in these companies and the, the, the requirement is that you have to stay in for four years, uh, you can claim tax relief in the year that you make the investment at your marginal rate of tax, which is typically 40%. Unfortunately, you don't get USC or VRSI relief, but you make the investment. So if you're making an investment now before the end of 2020, before New Year's Eve, you can claim relief in your 2020 tax return. So obviously that could factor in the amount of preliminary tax that you would be paying, okay? So that's how the tax relief works. But a comment I would have to make here is that it would be wrong to look at EIS purely as a tax scheme. This is actually, you have to look at the commercial aspect here. And in fact, you're better to start from the commercial angle, which is that what you're being presented with here is an opportunity to invest in a particular company. And you have to weigh up the pros and cons of that and look at the likely rate of return you're going to make and how good an investment you think it is and so on. Because you could lose all of your money on this if the company simply fails to deliver or goes to the wall and so on in a worst case scenario. And really the way to look at the tax relief here is that it reduces the original, the initial cost of your investment to 60% of what it would have been. So if you put 100,000 into, into an EIS scheme, you know, 
it's and you're getting forty thousand back in the form of a tax break essentially the real initial cost to you is 60 so that gives you a little bit of breathing space in terms of making the uh, you know making a return on your money and so on you know in terms of in terms of law and you know you really only put in 60 so if the company goes down by 20 percent it gives you back 80 you've still made a bit of money or if you look at another way if you look at the positives if the company goes up a lot in value your return is even better because you're you're not jumping from 100 to 150 or 120 or maybe you're jumping from the starting point of 60 really but the critical thing is to analyze it from a, from a commercial point of view in the first instance you will find solicitors they're a natural target for promoters of, of EIS schemes because obviously you're self-assessed taxpayers with potentially large one-off tax bills uh, at the end of the year and therefore uh, you know you may find yourself being being targeted by EIS promoters so there are two types typically that you'll see you might see a one-off investment in a single company um, or the second type of scheme you sometimes see are kind of these pool schemes the funds there are there are two of them in particular that are doing the rounds out there where essentially you buy units in the fund and the fund is diversified to cover maybe eight to ten different companies so you know uh, but the critical thing in all of them is to weigh up the commercial aspect in the first instance rather than letting the tax drive the decision yeah, there's a touch of buyer beware, I think, with EIS schemes and, and, and small early stage companies. Yes, yeah, there, there, there is. And I suppose the EIS itself has changed several times over the last five or six years. And whilst you, I, you wouldn't stereotype, it's really wrong to stereotype, so there are many types of companies, but it is now actually a scheme that's arguably more accessible for younger companies, maybe not necessarily immediate startups, but companies that are less than seven years old or else established companies that are engaging in a very significant expansion. It's just, which, which is arguably higher risk. Uh, it's just the nature of, of, of the rules for the companies to qualify. So absolutely. I mean, BES was its predecessor. It was introduced in 1984. So it's been around a long time, but it's had several iterations over the years. And, and always, you're, you're, you're right, Justin, it's, it's, it's a case of, as you say, buyer beware and a thorough, a thorough assessment of the, of the uh, quality of the investment in the first instance. And I, I think the, the budget announced also that there's to be a review of this scheme also uh, indeed, yeah. of the next couple of months. So. In the context of COVID, so they've had a lot of reviews of this scheme over the last few years. It's become a little bit unwieldy from the perspective of the companies themselves. So, yeah, we're going to have another review over the next while in the context of COVID-19 and the challenges that arise. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm conscious of, of time, Michael, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, sure. That's okay with you. Yeah, so here we're calling our accounting treatments and tax. So we won't go too technical here, but essentially what we're looking at here is that, okay, before we even get to the stage where you're presented with a tax return and what do I do vis-a-vis -vis pensions and EIS and so on, is there any way of, of getting your taxable profits down, essentially, within the rules? And the answer is there may very well be. And two very obvious areas that are of interest to solicitors would be bad debt provisions and, and WIP, work in progress. On the bad debt provisions, I suppose, particularly in, the, in light of the, of the times we're living in, it's probably advisable to look at your debtor's ledger and assess, are there any debts there that are maybe not collectible? And therefore, should you be making a provision? And if you make a specific bad debt provision, as opposed to a general one, you can, you can reduce your, your taxable profits accordingly, and therefore, by extension, obviously, your tax bill. Just a side point I'd make there as well, when you're looking at bad debts, you might also consider whether or not there's a possible VAT reclaim that you can make. If there are any bad debts that you are actually writing off in full that you feel are just definitely not collectible or being written off, you know, the company is in serious, the, the debtor is in serious difficulties, gone into liquidation or whatever, and you feel, well, no chance of getting that. You may, and you've already paid over the sales VAT, you may be able to get that back. And that's obviously a great cash flow help, but it could also bring down your taxable profits. On the work in progress, I mean, this is a huge area for solicitors, and I know we had, uh, about 15 years ago, there was a big change in the whole area of accounting for WIP. Now, I don't propose to go into the replace the technicalities of that, but the lesson here would be that valuing WIP, it is a technical area, there are a lot of complex rules, there are a lot of subjective areas in this as well. So, while it's on one level, that sounds like bad news, more, more complications. It does also, on the flip side, mean that you may very well, it may be worthwhile carrying out an exercise because could you push down your work in progress, you know, and thereby by extension your profit? Because the higher your whip recognized, the higher your profits and by extension your tax bill. So if you can push that down at your end, that could get you a cash flow saving. Now, pushing down your whip does not result 
in an ultimate reduction in your tax bill over the course of time, you're only pushing it forward into future years. But that does, still doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile because given the era we're living in where cash flow is a consideration, you know, pushing your whip from 2020 into 21 reduces the burden or even pushing it from 19 into 20 potentially reduces the burden because it reduces your 19 tax bill. And if you're basing preliminary based on 100% to 19, it also reduces your preliminary tax. So definitely an area that's worth looking at. Michael, we'll move on to the next slide if that's all right. If anybody has any questions, we're just coming up to 25 past one. So if anybody has any questions, we, we'd love to hear them now. Because... So commencement Mike. and cessation then is, is obviously a big area, complex area, I suppose, for sisters. So just make a couple of points here. Take the solicitor who's commencing. That is a solicitor who's just gone off into, into practice on their own, you know, set up their own business, a sole trader and so on, or somebody who's been admitted to partnership. There are a couple of very big challenges in the early years. I mean, first of all, it can be a real culture shock. You've gone from being a PAYE taxpayer that has their tax dealt with at source every month and you don't have to particularly worry about the stress of a year-end you know, tax bill to a situation where you have this, you have to face this every, typically every November, December this year. Um, secondly, in your first year as a sole, tra as a sole trader or admitted to partnership, you, you potentially, the first time you file a return, you might have actually two years worth of tax to pay because you're paying your tax for the first year, which has just elapsed, and you're also paying preliminary tax for the current year. You haven't paid any preliminary before now, so you get a, a double payment in your first year as such. Also, typically solicitors who commence, you know, in their first couple of years, they might see a steep upward curve in their profit share, which is nice, that's good in its own way, but unfortunately, it also leads to accelerated tax payments. So this can be a bit of a bumpy ride, and I think careful cash flow planning is required and make sure that you work out what your figures are well in advance of the, of the tax deadline. There's also the, the rules of commencement, which, you know, how do you tax the first year's profits? And because of the way they work, if you're not careful, a tranche of your first year's profits ends up being subject to tax twice. So careful planning is required there in terms of things like what year end you use, what your date of commencement is going to be, and, and, so, and, and so on, and even also careful recognition of profits. For the solicitor who's coming towards the end of the road, on the other hand, the rules of cessation are such that a tranche of your final year's profits might end up not being taxed at all. So that's the quid pro quo. You might get taxed twice on year one, but in, in the final year, you might see stuff dropping out. So clearly, if you're in that position, if you have a good year and you're thinking of retiring, question mark here is, might it be worth your while bringing forward your retirement and, and because you might have a one-off significant tax saving or at least factoring into your deliberations? Okay, Michael, I'm just going to uh, launch just the last poll there. We're just trying to ascertain business confidence out there and then we'll just jump on to the last slide. I know we're, we're slightly pushed for time and don't... Yes. The, the bit I'm most interested in here is this TWSS compliance letters, I think, which a lot of people have been getting, so... Yeah, absolutely. I think we probably touched on tax warehousing and all of that. And then, and then you have the wage subsidy scheme. So TWSS, as we all know, is a scheme that ran from the end of March to the end of August. And everybody who claimed this, every employer who claimed it, is now being the subject of a query from revenue. A, a letter is being issued. And you're being asked for the basis on which you claimed the scheme. Now, a general comment we'd make here is that obviously every business is different and you know, you have different circumstances and different results and so on. But the key question being asked here is around the famous turnover test, the requirement that you were expecting to be down by at least 25% in the second quarter. So revenue will ask you, were you actually down 25%? And if you were, well, that's a fairly straightforward answer, I suppose, you give them. But if you weren't actually down 25%, can you explain the basis on which you thought back at the end of March that you were likely to be down 25%? Now, I think typically with solicitors' practices, they, the rationale, the manner in which you expected COVID to hit your bottom line wasn't necessarily so much in the form of, you know, uh, invoices being raised in Q2, because to a large extent, they were based on, on WIP that had been uh, accrued in the pre-COVID era. But more than likely that you were expecting that your instructions, your client instructions during Q2 would be down significantly. Uh, now, certain sectors would, uh, of the solicitor's practice would be more impacted, you would think, than others. So if you're heavily involved in conveyancing, for example, you would have expected a significant dip, I suppose, 
um, or mergers and acquisitions, which largely were kind of frozen or postponed for a period there during Q2 because people didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, so you would make that point in your letter. So you'd simply set out in replying, as I said, you've either met the, the 25%, you were actually down 25, and if you weren't, you would set out kind of, well, we carried out an exercise at the end of March, we analyzed what was likely to happen, the government restrictions we felt created great uncertainty in the world, and we were expecting that because of the nature of our business, we were likely to see a 25% plus dip in, in, uh, in instructions or in, in customer orders other during, uh, to use the revenue phrase, during Q2. Um, every solicitor's practice will be different. If you look at the economic statistics, it seems to suggest that the domestic economy during Q2, whatever about our, our multinationals, that the domestic economy was down in terms of consumption and so on, somewhere between 30 and 38%. Uh, which would seem to imply that if you have a solicitor's practice, an SME type practice that is largely servicing clients in the domestic economy, you might have expected a similar type reduction in your own case. Now, that's just simply to guide what revenues thought process might be. That's what they might be expecting to see. But naturally, every practice is, is different, and, and I'm sure I'm sure some practices were were impacted differently to others. You know, depending on on, on the type of client base you have, and so on. Listen, Michael, that, that, that's great. We're, we're just out of time. So I, I, I point out that if, pe if people want some more information about this, this session, we're gonna, uh, it's going to be recorded and we're going to send out the slides. And then we've also got a small practice bulletin going out on this very topic also. So that provides uh, more in-depth detail. So I, I'd ask you to keep your, your eye out for that as well. I think interestingly, just on that poll that we uh, ran there on confidence in the economy, it's split 50-50. Are you more confident now than in March? So, so it's a very interesting sort of uh, result, I suppose. Um, and then the other point to make is that next week, uh, our next week's session is updates on capacity law in practice with uh, Anya Hines, a uh, recently uh, appointed uh, senior counsel. So we're, we're really looking forward to that. Listen, Mial, would you like to, to sum up? Uh, but thanks a million for, for, for giving us your information today. It's been brilliant uh, to hear all about it and see, hear the nuances of, of, of the budget as it imp uh, impacts on uh, making a tax return. Thank you very much, uh, Justin. Yeah, and I suppose the comment to make would be that careful planning now, you know, ahead, ahead of the various deadlines, and also just in light of what we might call the hot off the press stuff that we got yesterday, watch out for the finance bill, which is being published next week, because some of, and indeed revenue guidance notes, because some of these things yesterday, they'll be flesh we put on the bones, and some of the uncertainties will hopefully be cleared up as well. Okay, well, if, if nobody has any questions for us, uh, we'll call it a day and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week. Again, thanks to, uh, to Michael, uh, for, uh, from, he's the tax uh, director at Crow, um, for all of his uh, brilliant insights. So thanks a lot, Michael, and uh, we'll see you all next week with uh, Capacity Law and Practice with Anya Hines. Sloan. So